who joined the Oxford University Press, spent 30 years there only to leave and start your business. I feel that I've come home. I think the pirated market was bigger than us. So a lot of people say that audiobooks are not the same thing. Very convenient. We have. What is your view on the single national curriculum? I think it is neither single nor national. I mean, you know, people have uh, launched startups when they're in their 20s. But I launched my startup in my 70s. Hello and welcome everyone to Digitales. My name is Fazan Sayed, founder and CEO of East River. And today, before I introduce my guest, I want you to subscribe to our channel. A lot of you who watch this show and watch this content we notice are not subscribed. It would be great if you can subscribe so you can get the latest updates and the latest content that we're putting out there. And so today, we have someone who was the former managing director of the Oxford University Press. She's been recognized by the British Queen by receiving the Order of the British Empire, the, known as the OBE. She's also a Knight of Arts and Letters by the French government. And she's also received a Sitara Imtiaz by the Pakistani government. Ms. Amina Sayed, how are you today? I'm very well, thank you. Thank you for taking the time out. And I found your career journey really interesting. You started off as a school teacher for the Lahore American School. You then went on to start your own publishing house, your own business, uh, Sayed Publishers, mm -hmm. before you joined the Oxford University Press, spent 30 years there, only to leave and start your business again called Lightstone Publishers today? That's right. You know, I feel that I've come home. You've come home by starting your own business after uh, retiring in a sense. That's right, after a gap of 30 years. Wow. I regard that as a kind of a detour, a very long detour. That's a long detour. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I'll quickly explain why yeah. I stopped running my own business, Sayyid Books. And the reason was that um, actually my main interest was to become a publisher. Okay. And publishing requires a lot of investment. So when I started Sayyid Books, uh, initially I couldn't make that investment. So I thought, well, uh, until then, let me uh, become a trader of books. So I used to import books and distribute them, both school books and books of general interest. Um, and that was doing very well. And I found that, you know, my bank balance was growing and growing. But I didn't have that satisfaction of being an originating publisher. And that's when this offer came from Oxford University Press to join them. And initially they said, we would like you to become the head of our marketing department. Mm -hmm. So I said, but you must be joking. I mean, I'm a proprietor of a growing business. Uh, so why would I become a marketing head? So they said, then what, what can um, we do to, you know, to persuade you to join us? I said, well, I have to become the country head. So they agreed. And uh, my family actually discouraged me, especially my sister. And um, my sister, I mentioned it to her and she said, you must be mad. <laughs> that was, <laughs> she said, you are running your own business. It's growing. Why do you want to leave it for a salaried job? But again, as I said that, you know, I needed the support and the resources to publish, which I must say, OUP provided. And I was able to publish thousands of books over 30 years. But somehow I always had this hankering um, because, you know, in a very big organization, it becomes a big bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. Decision making becomes slow. And I found that some of our authors used to be frustrated because we couldn't make up, make decisions fast enough. And sometimes books would go out of date. So even I was becoming frustrated, but I had to follow the process. Uh, so when I retired, I started my own publishing company again. And I must say, it is very exciting. I mean, you know, people have uh, launched startups when they're in their 20s. But I launched my startup in my 70s. Wow. And I must say, it's exciting. So how, really is it, how is it different the second time around? Because there's a big gap of almost 30 plus years. Yes. Since the first time you started your business and then the second time. What is, what is different this time around? Well, I think um, the difference is that... Um, I know the, the business, the market, the customers, um, even the, 
the sort of talent uh, very well, not just in Pakistan, but around the world. Because uh, at OUP, I was doing a lot of traveling, meeting people from different countries. I mean, certainly I had a lot of, um, ex you know, exposure and advantages. So I think that is what, in now in a way, I'm in a far better position to run a publishing company. Uh, and it's that much easier. Um, because when I was in the first time round, I was a bit of a novice. I was learning. Uh, but I think now it's, uh, you know, when you know who the vendors are, uh, who the distributors are, who the authors are, it makes it that much easier. So you've got, you know everyone. Basically on your phone, I'm sure you've got all the right numbers and getting things done is just a lot faster now than it was probably then. I think so. I think it's certainly much easier. Because right. people, all, I mean, not only do I know them, but they also know me. Right. And so there's so, credibility that comes with that. That's right. And a relationship. Right. And you mentioned earlier that there's a big investment that was required or is required in publishing. Walk us through what that investment looked like, looks like um, for anyone looking to get into this space. Well, the investment is uh, really in uh, creating content. Okay. In engaging authors, uh, paying authors, then not just authors, but illustrators, designers. Um, and when the book is, and then of course, uh, paying for production. The you actual know, printing. printing of the book. The actual so printing. you're saying that in, in running a publishing house or having a publishing business, you actually have to commission an author, tell the author to come up with an idea on a certain subject, have the illustrations done for that, then take that completed, let's say, the book and have it printed at scale for distribution. That's right. I mean, illustration and design. And illustration and design are heavy costs for school textbooks. Okay. For general books, less so. But the printing cost is very heavy. Uh, because, you know, paper costs are also now going up so much. Right. And apart from printing, the storage and warehousing and distribution, packing, all that. Uh, and then above all, promotion and marketing. I mean, it's you can't just print a book and put it in your warehouse. Right. You have to shout from the rooftops and tell people about it so that they're attracted to buy to buy books. And the books that we're considering here are school textbooks that are the most profitable to be in? Is that the space to be in, in publishing? Uh, it is, because actually that is where um, the revenue comes from, from school textbooks. And with that revenue, the profits that you make from that, then you can publish general books. Because general books are not, um, don't sell in thousands. They may sell in hundreds, books of general interest, unless there's a special book. I mean, for example, we published uh, a novel by Omar Shahid Hamid called Betrayal, mm -hmm. which has been a bestseller. So that has sold in thousands. So let's say, but it doesn't cross 10,000? No, and for, sadly it doesn't. So in a country of 220 plus million people, a bestseller mm -hmm. doesn't even sell 10,000 books? And that's an English book, right? An English book, yes. Let's say an Urdu bestseller. Well, you know, you'd be surprised. Uh, Urdu, I mean, we feel that Urdu books will sell more, right. but they don't. Because I think it's the English readership that buys books. So Urdu, what do you, an Urdu bestseller would sell how many books? I think uh, around a thousand, 500 to a thousand. Wow. So an Urdu, Maybe it'll go up to two thousand. How, how is that commercially viable at all? Well, it's only viable if you print a lot of books. Right. So it adds up. I mean, you can't print, uh, publish five books a year and right. do well. You know, you have to publish, uh, you know, 30, 40, 50, ideally 100 books a year. But if you're only doing a thousand books to become a bestseller, how, well, wh where is the unit economics on that? I mean, you don't make money on that, I'm assuming. I th on a thousand, you make a little bit of money. Right. Uh, but, um, you know, if you publish a uh, hundred books, then it sort of adds up. Right. But then you have to, as I said, publish a lot of books. And what about school textbooks? How many school textbooks are published every year? A typical, let's say, a seventh grade, sixth grade math textbook. Oh, um, they, if it's popular, if, if, if it's widely used, the, the number could go up to 20, 30,000. So a, a textbook would be at 20,000. 20 to 30,000 if it's popular. An average yes. textbook would be, I'm assuming, 10,000. Average would be 5 to 10,000. But there are more than five to 10,000 students 
in any class in any year. So where are they getting the books from if it's not from the publisher? Uh, no, they're buying books from these. Are, are you talking about school textbooks? School textbooks. You see, the, uh, what happens is that uh, a school prescribes a text. I'm talking about private schools, not government schools. Correct. So um, a private school will prescribe a book, say, for English for class five. Right. So every student in that school will buy that book. Okay. That school may have, uh, in class five, a school may have, say, 100 or 200 students. Sure. The bigger schools, um, you know, the bigger chain schools may have a couple of thousand students. So if you get, uh, say, 100 schools to prescribe that book in class seven, the number can go up to 30, 40,000. Got it. In some rare cases, it goes up to 100,000. Right. So that's, uh, that can be uh, profitable. And that's recurring revenue because the same textbook for the same class every year has been prescribed. Um, almost. Because sometimes uh, parents, you know, children hand over their books to their younger True. sibling. So th and sometimes they buy, but mostly... It but you know it can actually remain the same. It can even grow because other schools may be, may adopt it the following year. And is there a piracy issue? Do you lose out to like the pirated copies that you get in Urdu Bazaar? It's a massive issue, piracy. How many units do you think you lose to piracy of the same textbook every year? Well, when I was at Oxford University Press, I think the pirated market was bigger than us. Hmm. They were course, actually selling sense. more. And is there a big price differential? Well. You know, you'd be surprised there's no price difference. What happens is pirates actually uh, deceive parents. They sell the pirated book uh, as the original book at the same price. What they do is they give a far bigger discount to the middleman or to the bookseller. So the pirate will give, um, uh, you know, maybe 10 or 20 percent more discount. Mm. So the retailers are then... I'm more encouraged. inclined to carry the pirated book instead hmm. of the original book because That's they're incentivized right. more. Yes. Even though the pirated book, the only cost there is the cost of copying and the pages. That's right. No development cost no at development all. No development cost no, at all. And no taxes. They don't pay taxes. So the parents are better off than buying from the publisher then because they, at least the revenue is going to the right place. That's right. Yeah, And they're getting uh, the authentic better book. quality. Right. I remember that at OUP, people used to tell me that, you know, why is it your, the quality of your books is going down? It's not the same. Right. And it turned out that they were buying pirated books. So not only were we losing sales, we were also, our image was being affected by it. So, I mean, piracy is a terrible uh, a sort of discouragement. How did you manage that publishing. in your time at OUP? Well, it was a constant struggle. Uh, we used to, and the Pakistan laws, copyright laws are very weak. And the enforcement is even weaker. And then there's a strong mindset. You know, some people actually, this Robin Hood mindset, that, oh, we are selling cheaper books because it's a poor country. We can't afford to buy. There's that mindset. Um, well, you know, I had to invoke the law as much as possible, carry out police-assisted raids. If you found out that somebody is selling we would report it to the and uh, police, the local police station. They would carry out raids. It was an ongoing struggle. Sometimes we even went into um, printers where they, they were being printed and seized stocks. But it was really an ongoing battle. We managed to reduce it considerably, but we couldn't wipe it out. Why do you think there, is, there isn't a culture of reading in Pakistan? Because, I mean, you're saying that if you sell a few thousand books, you're a bestseller, right? And in the Western world, you know, you need to sell a couple of million books to be that same level. Is it a problem with uh, the education system? Is it, is it a mindset issue? Is it a cultural issue? Why are we not a nation of readers? Well, uh, yes, I have to admit that we are not. But I won't say that we are... Um, we don't read at all because, you know, I've survived for 30 years in, uh, with no help. I mean, just by produce, publishing books and selling books. And I'm still surviving. So people do buy books. I think the only difference is, of course, I mean, we may be 230 million, but how many of us are literate? Uh, I'm, you know... Uh, I say 50%, 40%. You know, not even that. <laughs> not even that. I would say 15%. The reason is... right that the definition, when we say 50 or 56%, the definition of literacy 
is that we can sign our, our name. Right. But to be able to read a book, I, I think it's probably 15%. So if let's say 15% of, let's say 200 million people, mm. right? That works out to about 30 million people. Yes. Let's say of the 30 million, 1% should at least read books. That's at least 300,000 readers, right? Why is the number still so low for a book uh, publishing that it's in the thousands, you know, I, it's still surprising. Is it, is it a mindset? Are we just not a reading nation? Well, I think one reason is that we don't have libraries. So people have to buy every book they read. And I think that's right. not fair. They shouldn't have to buy every book that they read because, you know, sometimes you read a book a month. We don't have a system of libraries. It's amazing how f the few libraries we have. The ones that we have, you know, you f they're not well, well equipped. They don't have the latest books. And, it, you know, it would help publishers. If we had a network of thousands of libraries across Pakistan, mm -hmm. each library would buy a copy. So automatically a publisher would sell a couple of thousand copies. Right, okay. So publishers are suffering. Readers are also suffering because they can't be uh, forced to buy every book that they read. So I think that is one reason. I think the other reason is that there is not enough marketing and promotion which is why I started the Karachi Literature Festival. Now I'm doing the other festival. The whole idea is to um, draw people into books. And I think it's been an amazing uh, experience because, you know, if you introduce the author to the reader uh, and they start interacting, you know, mm -hmm. there's a lot of interest uh, and interest develops in the book. I remember in one of our festivals, we got, um, you know, our festivals are free and open to all. So a child came uh, from Liari with his father. And along the festival, we have a, a, a book fair. So I remember the child asking his father that, but today is Sunday, so why are there books here? So, I mean, you know, he thought that books can only be read in school. Mm. So this was what we were trying to uh, convey uh, to people who attended the festival, you know, create an aspiration and also let them know the books are for fun. They're for reading, right. for enjoyment, and you can read them uh, anytime. Anytime and uh, have fun. Right. It's not that you, it's a textbook that you have to read on a weekday in school. And by having this uh, literature festival, and it's extremely popular and very well attended. In fact, you've even taken uh, this to London in the form of the Pakistan Film Fest uh, for a Pakistan Literature Festival. Gee, that's right. Right. How has that changed the way an author is perceived or their books are sold? Has that done anything for the author's uh, um, uh, experience? I think it's done a lot. I remember um, Mohsen Hamid came to one of my festivals. And, you know, in every session, we try to make it interactive. So if we have 15 or 20 minutes of um, Q&A. And, um, you know, some of the questions that people ask Mohsen Hamid were very challenging questions. And uh, at the end of it, he was very pleased and he was telling me, he said that, you know, now I know the impact that my books have on readers and what people in Karachi think of my books and what question, you know, uh, arise in their minds. So they're actually very pleased about that. Um, I think, um, I mean, my idea was that our authors are world class and, you know, we don't um, recognize and acknowledge them. We don't reward them the way they are rewarded in India. So in my festivals, we started uh, awards, you know, best fiction, best modern fiction, best Urdu literature, and so various awards in order to recognize our authors. And I remember in one of the festivals, uh, you know, I saw a large group of people, a very large group walking in one direction, and I got worried. I thought this must be uh, some kind of a security mm -hmm. issue. So I looked around for security and then I went towards a crowd and I saw that they were following Amar Jamil, Amar Jalil, the Sindhi writer. Right. You know, they, they, these were his fans who were just following him. Wow. And I felt my dreams come true. He's become a rock star. <laughs> <laughs> and he must have felt the same way. Where else does he get this kind I of hope. opportunity? And yes, and the fans were so thrilled. Exactly. To meet him. Interesting. And then, you know, they all, all always buy books which are available then and there. They right. can have them signed. Right. So it creates a real uh, dynamic Interesting. about reading.
So touching on the whole reading part of it, right? And, you know, I'm, I'm curious to understand better why we don't have uh, a nation of readers. Do you think, what is your view on the single national curriculum? And do you think this impacts our ability as a nation to be readers? I think it does. I think it is neither single nor national, the curriculum. It's, in fact, it's creating a division because every province has to approve, I mean, particularly the uh, Punjab, uh, also KP, Azad Kashmir, um, the Islamabad capital territory. Fortunately, the Sindh government rejected it. Um, and uh, that, that was um, by Sayyid Sardar Shah, the education uh, minister, who had a wonderful um, alternative to it. But I think that, um, you know, how can they say it's single? Because, um, for example, KP would make their own changes because every book had to be put through a review process. So let's take a step back. The single national curriculum meant that the curriculum for all students in all grades would be the same regardless of the province. Across Pakistan. Across yes. Pakistan. That's right. But for the curriculum to be the same, each province would be able to submit its changes and feedback yes. into the curriculum. Uh, not into the curriculum, into textbooks. Into the textbooks. Yes. So that means that every textbook would be tweaked by each province. By each province, yes. The <laughs> According to its own wisdom. Okay, I was going to come to that. So first of all, we have to get the provinces in unison on a certain topic. Is that even possible? Impossible. It didn't happen. Right. And so why would that even be an idea? Why was that even floated if we knew that was going to fail? I think it was just um, uh, really it was some kind of a, a ridiculous idea because I mean, yes, it was absolutely bound to fail because of the 18th Amendment, education is a uh, prov provincial subject. It's a provincial subject. And each province should be able to do it on its own. Yes. And they did it. They uh, actually asserted their own um, autonomy in this. Punjab said that we are going to decide. And uh, they, they were in a way in their rights to do that. So they decided what would go into the textbooks that were submitted to them. I submitted my books to them. And actually they mutilated them because of the changes they wanted. KP wanted its own changes. They had their own mindset, their own thinking about what should go into a textbook. Azad Kashmir did the same. So... First of all, you couldn't have, and you know, schools actually suffered because some schools are, you know, they are in all provinces, some of the chain schools. So they said that we have to have different books for each province. So you could be part of a chain school network, but the child studying in Islamabad would get a different experience than the one in Karachi, than the one in Peshawar. That's right. And for you know, the same subject. Yes, for the same subject. And if parents are transferred, they can't benefit from using the same textbook. Right. So it actually created chaos. If you were to create a curriculum for this country from scratch, what would it look like? Well, actually, you know, I have to admit the uh, curriculum is okay. Um, I, I don't have much against the curriculum. I think it's very progressive, fairly liberal. Um, the Pakistan National Curriculum. That, that was made in 2006. The, I wouldn't say the single national curriculum, which was actually, uh, the, it had a lot of material from the 2006 curriculum. Um, but it's the way that the curriculum is reflected in books. So the Pakistan national curriculum is fine. Yes. But the way it's translated into books is not fine. That's right. So how would you change that part of it? Well, I think, uh, you know, publishers should be free to use the national curriculum because actually a national curriculum is made, it's a kind of a guide, it's a framework. It should not be very prescriptive. It shouldn't tell you that uh, this is how you teach this subject. You should give the broad... Um, the broad strokes and then you yes, can take it from and there. and the objectives. Right. Uh, and then let publishers do their job. Right. Um, and then of course, uh, then school should be able to um, have a choice. Publishers can submit their books to schools and they can decide what suits them. And their. But, you know, if you force schools that you have to use books that are approved by the 
provincial, uh, the Punjab, for example, Punjab Curriculum and Tech Support. They have to use books that are approved by them. And they actually, they issue an NOC, No Objection Certificate. And, you know, schools are actually being raided. Children's bags are being uh, searched. Wow, School really? cupboards are being searched to make sure that they had NOCs. If they didn't, they were fined and they were threatened with closure. So it was a draconian um, law and it's still there. It's still there. In the Punjab. I believe that it's been somewhat relaxed uh, at in Islamabad, but it's still there. Okay. In KP, AJK, it's still there. In Balochistan, I think they never officially rejected it, but they didn't enforce it. Sindh rejected it outright. Interesting. All right. So one of the questions I had is around the content. Do you think our national curriculum should be in one language or should it be in multiple languages? Well, I think, uh, I think again, the option should be there. But, uh, you know, it's uh, you should... Maybe you won't be surprised, but parents want their children to learn English. So should the curriculum only be in English? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think, you know, for example, um, children actually learn best in their own language, in their mother tongue. And the Citizens Foundation has now made Urdu the medium of instruction. But if higher education world over takes place primarily in English, and let's say doctorate uh, education is also primarily in the English language. And if we see the world, let's say in terms of the technology world, um, coding is all in English. Um, advertising, most of it is in English. You know, so if English is the dominant language, are we at a disadvantage by not giving our kids that education so that they can rise to the top with it? Um, I agree absolutely for higher education, for as you said, doctoral uh, level, and of course, for, for technology, you need to know English. Uh, but, you know, I think that it's also very important for children in, uh, in primary schools to understand concepts. And I think uh, they, they can understand concepts better if they are taught in their mother tongue. I mean, it can even, even be Sindhi or Urdu. But... Uh, they have to learn English later. And, you know, I've studied the education system in Turkey. I spent some time there and I visited schools. They were all in Turkish. They were being taught in Turkish. Every school, even the high-end schools, Tur Turkish was the medium of instruction. However, they said that after, uh, at a certain age, I think it was immediately, it was after they had uh, finished school and were about to enter college, they were given a year of just learning English. And, uh, you know, it was like a, a sort of learning English in a, a sort of focused way for a year. And within a year, they were able to master in the language enough to do their higher education in English. Perhaps you could do something like that over here. But I just feel that uh, English must be taught as a subject rather than as a medium of instruction, at least uh, up to school level. And then maybe a year of learning English. And that's because you feel that the concepts would be clearer to the students in uh, terms of the way the concepts are taught to the students. That's right, yes. Otherwise, you find that they are just learning by heart. Right. I mean, I remember as a child, I used to, because we were, my parents always spoke to us in Urdu. And, uh, but English, I would learn by heart. Without understanding. Interesting. And people do that. Children do that. It's only natural. And so if learning should be in the native language so that the concepts are explained clearly, if we were to switch over for a second and step away from publishing and let's say the curricula and we look at the age we live in, video content is cheaper to access than it is to buy a book. Right? Mm -hmm. In this age where video is cheap, and anyone can produce video content. Are we degrading the quality of knowledge that our society is consuming and sharing? And if so, how does that get controlled? Because if everyone is relying on video and not text and verifying uh, the source of the information, you know, so concepts might be clearer, but 
the wrong concept, it's easier to also disseminate the wrong concept. How can you put a check on that in your view? Well, uh, I, absolutely. I mean, I say the same thing about the internet, that um, it's not actually verified or, or checked. So there's a lot of um, incorrect or unsuitable, inappropriate content out there. Uh, so you mean, how can children be protected from that? Right. Well, I think that, you know, if they can, through um, to sort of guiding them and teaching them about the, uh, the right kind of content, and of course, the right kind of content or something that is appropriate for their level uh, and suitable, you know, culturally, I think it'll have to be just as interesting. It can't be bland or boring content because it's very important that children should be attracted and engaged um, in, in this kind of content. So we have to produce that kind of con content and somehow build that into their, into their lives and also into their school education. I mean, now in many of our books, we actually, to explain something, we give links to um, this kind of content that children can refer to. And is it, is it possible or is that sort of the norm going forward where you mentioned a publisher needs to commission an author, then commission, let's say, the design, the text, and then actually publish it. If you're actually commissioning an author in the content of a book, can that content not be, be, be disseminated in two mediums, one being the print medium and the other being, let's say, a video or a digital medium? Whereas the book could be, let's say, in the form of an audio book, or the book could be animated, let's say, for kids, or it could be like a video book on, let's say, a YouTube channel. So now the same content, the original content, verified content, is now reaching different audiences through different mediums where so the content is the same. Well, if you're talking about school textbooks, for example, um, with every textbook, we have a, a portal that a child can go uh, access. For example, we have simplified classics as readers, um, again, to get them into reading. So we have books like Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn for children. Now, with the book, they can actually access the website that goes with the book. When they go onto the website, they can hear the story it's an audio book, they can, it, they can hear the entire story read in uh, a good standard English accent. They can also, uh, there'll be more exercises that they can um, do. And then for teachers, there are tips on how to make. So, we, you know, we use this kind of uh, material to support. So it's a supporting material. Yes, but uh, if you're talking about an ebook, right? Uh, we try to avoid that because, you know, with ebooks, uh, piracy becomes very easy. Right, okay. And also, you know, we want to sell the print books. Right. Uh, I mean, there's also that uh, business decision. Of course. Not to go in for e-books. Right. Uh, but we have a lot of supporting uh, um, online material to support all our books. How do you view the market for audiobooks? Audible as a platform did really well during COVID. Subscriptions increased and so on. Do you think that Audiobooks are a good substitute for the physical textbook if you're reading, let's say, a novel or you're reading a biography or something? Yes, absolutely. For novels, for any books of general interest. Actually, now most of these books have audiobooks. And the technology is such that, I mean, literally, if you have the, uh, the soft copy of the book online with the press of a button, it can be converted into an audiobook. And you can even choose what kind of, do you want it, a Pakistani accent? Do you want a British accent? Or do you want an American accent? You can choose that. In fact, I believe now they can, uh, for example, you know, if you publish a book, uh, say on Jinnah, um, you can, you know, we have recordings of Jinnah's voice and the, the stress and intonation of his speech. You can actually have the entire book read in Jinnah's voice. Right. Uh, so, I mean, technology True. is just, it's incredible how fast it's progressing. But do you think that audio, so a lot of people say that audiobooks are not the same thing. Like it's it's one thing reading the book and feeling the paper and the smell of the printed Absolutely. text. And it's another thing listening to a book. Yes. But w what's your view? Because, so I'm a, so I, I hadn't read for a while. And audiobooks is what got me back into, well, listening, not reading. And now I'm at at least one book a month. 
thanks to audiobooks because i find that i'm able to consume the content much e- in a much easier manner sitting in a car you know going for a walk riding a bike i'm able to consume the content i'm able to visualize it and digest it to me the experience is the same but to traditional to purists or traditionalists they say you know what no it's not the same what's your view well i am uh, my view is that you know i love to hold a book uh, in fact you know uh, when i'm visiting a customer and i'm trying to sell a book i try to get them to hold the book it's not that i'm holding the book and telling them i put it in their hand i want them to turn the pages and it gives you know it creates a relationship with the book so i feel that you know the smell of a f- freshly printed book is lovely and then you like to look at the cover you admire the cover it's as if the book is all dressed up for you but so you don't get that experience when you are either reading it on kindle or mm-hmm. listening to it but having said that i have to say that you know people for people who commute or as you say go for jogs or whatever it's it's uh, it's great it's convenient to, it's very convenient to have what about blinkist what's your view on blinkist that summarizes books into these blinks so you can actually take an entire book that would have taken you maybe let's say a week to read and now you know on this app you can actually read the summaries of the entire chapters within let's say 10 minutes well i think that's all right you know if, if people want to for social conversation they if they want to be um uh, well informed about right. new books and to be able to talk about it but you know it's not the same pleasure the w- the pleasure that you get for example um a suitable boy by vikram seth right i saw the um drama that they made it was an eight episode drama i saw that after reading the book and i was uh, totally uh, disheartened because it wasn't as much fun as i had reading the book um so you know it it just i think no nothing can replace what a book um offers you they say that about uh, harry potter and lord of the rings too i've neither watched the movie nor read the book so i can't comment but i mm. hear the same said about that well you know i i read harry harry potter and the philosopher's stone and i saw the film also and i can s- truthfully say that i enjoyed reading the book more than watching right. the film the film can't capture every word every page of the book it sort right. of takes the highlights plus it is your imagination versus the imagination of the director that's right yes so Absolutely. how you imagine something will be very different from how someone else imagines it and you know some things the director will just ignore yeah, right which uh, you would have picked up on exactly yes. interesting and one other thing related to not just novels and textbooks is poetry you know poetry in school we read the traditional poets and you know very traditional poetry do you think that poetry is still relevant today in its traditional form or is poetry to be consumed in a new form for the younger generation for it to be relevant still well i think i mean poetry is very important fiction and poetry are really really important because actually they are the real they tell you about history much more than history books how so uh, well because you know history is always written in a way uh, there's a lot of uh, censorship in it and people are have their own um, you know it's, it's written way, by the victor that's right <laughs> yes but people who have um, have their own feeling they want to express something right and they're not uh, afraid of being um, punished for it or uh you know by the government of the of the day uh they can express themselves far more through uh fiction i mean you know i was told that during zial hawks days when there was total censorship a lot was being written in uh, in plays and in poetry and in um, in fiction so you learn more about what happened in those days through this um through um, you know other genres and do you think that the kids nowadays will be able to pick up on the nuances of the poetry written at that time and this well, is the tiktok generation that i'm talking about you know yes well maybe not kids right i think but it's very important to introduce children to to poetry uh, at a young age it can be any form of poetry but i think it's it's very important because you know the rhythm uh, of it 
because it, you remember poetry far more easily uh, than you actually, and you know, you can it stays with you all your life. You can recite it. Right. You can think about it. Uh, and I think just the use of words, the rhyming, the, the stresses, I think it's so important. It really teaches language in a, in a very important way. Interesting. And the last question I wanted to ask you, I think, you know, in, in, in this digital age, and obviously I'm involved in the digital business, so I have a slightly skewed view towards it. A lot of people consume content, gather information, develop opinions based on the digital data that's fed to them through the social media, through uh, various forms of media that they consume online. The challenge with that is that the algorithms feed you more of what you consume most. So if they see you consuming something, they'll give you more of that. That creates mm -hmm. a very polarized view. It doesn't create a balanced view. However, if you are a prolific reader, you would actually go and seek out different forms of content because the search and the choice is yours rather than it being fed to you. How can we maintain some level of balanced understanding, balanced research and fight that algorithm that feeds us information if we were to continue relying on textbooks? How do we create a balanced view on society? Uh, well, uh, what you've described is very counterproductive. And I feel the most important thing is to get uh, children and students to think on their own. And the only way you can do that, because if they are fed the same kind of information, obviously they're not going to go beyond that. Uh, mm -hmm. And also, I think the idea is not to confine themselves to sourcing information from, from one source. It definitely should not be entirely, it shouldn't come from their textbooks. And I find that, you know, anything that you want uh, children to know about, people say, oh, add it to the curriculum. As if the curriculum book is the only book they're going to read. I think they have to, of course, they have to read their textbooks. They have to read library books. The school must have a well-equipped library. They have to read newspapers, magazines, and they must attend I would say they have to attend literature festivals and hear people speaking, attend panel discussions. Uh, and then they, they have, if they are interested in a certain subject, they have to read about that subject written by different people and they will get different viewpoints. So when they get all these different viewpoints, if they're exposed to all of them, then they process that information in their minds and then they form their own opinions. And that is what critical thinking is all about. And I think it is absolutely important that we develop this kind of critical thinking of sourcing information from a wide range of sources. Sounds like a lot of work for the TikTok generation. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's fun. It is. Uh, I mean, it's fun going to um, watching a, a documentary. It's fun, uh, I mean, film is a big source. Right. And reading different books, going to libraries, going to festivals. And I think that the fact that you've actually created a platform for them, the Literature Festival, that's an easy way to actually go and develop that interest and mm -hmm. see different people speak on one subject through a panel discussion. And actually argue, uh, argue. And actually argue and debate it. And I think that actually creates a, a very interesting format. I mean, you should bring that onto YouTube. You know, do that on a regular basis. I think that's I a great I format. <laughs> and we'll help you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for taking out the time. This was really interesting. I'm so glad I was able to catch you and have this discussion with you. Thank you and wish you all the best uh, with Lightstone Publishers. I hope that uh, this entrepreneurial journey of yours yields the success you've been seeking. And Thank I you think very it's much. A, it's an inspiration for a lot of young people to see that it doesn't matter at what point in life you start your entrepreneurial journey. The fact that you start it is what matters. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And please come to our next Adab Festival, which is in November. Thank you so much. Year. So November, Adab Festival and the location is? Frere Hall. Frere Hall. Stay tuned for this and there'll be more information around it. We hope to see you there. Thank you once again for being on Digitales. Subscribe if you like the content and we look forward to seeing you next week. Bye-bye.